Good morning, everyone. Um, so today we are here to discuss to have a revision on the ball and socket joints of extremities. I think you know that uh, how the joints are classified. What is a joint? Joint is an articulation between two or more bones, which permit the movement at that area. Okay. So joints they are classified into three types: fibrous joints, cartilaginous, and the synovial joint. Okay, again, the synovial joints, uh, they're highly movable. Whereas the fibrous joints are immovable, cartilaginous are slightly movable. So these synovial joints, again, they are of seven types, among which one is the, the highly evolved one is the ball and socket type of synovial joint. Okay. So why it is called as ball and socket type of joint? Because the articular surfaces are uh, in the shape of a ball and a socket. The articular surface of one bone is in the form of a ball, another bone is in the form of a socket. Okay, so based upon the shape of the articular surfaces, the, this type of joint is called as ball and socket type of synovial joint. Okay, these are also called as spheroidal joint. Okay. As I told, the rounded surface of one bone moves within the depression of another bone. And this ball and socket type of joint allows a great freedom of movement than any other type of joints in our body. Okay. And they are highly developed in case of mammals. And they are highly developed in the region of hip and the shoulder. Okay. And here the movements, as I told, there is a great freedom of movement means the movements are taking place in all planes, okay, uh, in all planes and also there is a rotation around the central axis of the bone, okay. So that's why these are called as multi-axial type of joint. So the best examples are the two regions in the hip region and the shoulder region. In the hip region, it is a hip joint and in the shoulder region, it is a shoulder joint, okay. So this shoulder joint, we know, it's an articulation between the head of the humerus with the glenoidal cavity of the scapula. Okay, so what are the articular surfaces? Before going into that, you should know that anywhere, uh, if a joint is to be described, first you have to write the type of the joint, next articular surfaces, next what are the ligaments, next what are the relations, next is the movements, muscles producing the movements, Arterial supply, nerve supply, and the applied aspects. And if there are any bursa related to the joint. Okay. So, first, the shoulder joint articular surfaces. So, there are two articular surfaces one forms the ball, another forms the socket. So, the ball is formed by the largest bone of the upper wing, nothing but the humerus, the head of the humerus, forms one third of a sphere, nothing but the ball of the shoulder joint, which fits into the glenoidal cavity of the scapula. This glenoidal cavity is the, nothing but the lateral angle of the scapula, where there is a pear-shaped depression. So these are the two articulating surfaces. These two articular surfaces, they are covered by means of the articular cartilage. Yes. So articular cartilage is nothing but the hyaline articular cartilage. Okay. So the articular surfaces are two, one is the head of the humerus, another one is the glenoidal cavity, covered by means of the articular cartilage. So this cartilage is thick in the center of the head of the humerus. When it reaches the periphery, it is thin, okay. Reverse is for the glenoidal cavity. It is thin in the center and when it is approaching towards the periphery, it is thick. Next. Uh, so the, as in the synovial joint, they are covered by capsule and the capsule is lined interiorly by the synovial membrane, a serous membrane which secretes the synovial fluid. And this fluid permits the easy movement of the artic, uh, between the articular surfaces. So there is a capsule, capsular ligament. So this capsular ligament is attached to the both articular surfaces of the joint. So one Articular surface is formed by the humerus, another one is formed by the glenoidal cavity of the scapula. So you should know where the capsule is attached. It is attached along the anatomical neck of the humerus, okay, and along the glenoidal cavity of the scapula. 
just outside the glenoidal lab just outside the glenoidal lab you, uh, you will see the attachment of the capsular ligament okay so this capsular ligament is uh, loose and lax why it is loose and lax because to permit the movements as i told this type of joint shows high range of mobility that is due to the looseness and the laxity of the capsular ligament okay so attachment the anatomical neck of the humerus and the glenoidal cavity of the scapula just uh, outside the glenoidal labrum so what is this glenoidal labrum i think you know it's a fibrocartilaginous ring which is attached along the periphery of the glenoidal fossa because it makes the glenoidal fossa is a shallow one it deepens the glenoidal fossa okay so this capsule presents openings okay so one of the opening just below the uh, coracoid process okay below just below the coracoid process you will see one of the opening of the capsule of the shoulder joint okay uh, through which the synovial membrane out pouches as a bursa and forms a sub uh, bursa for the subscapularis sternum this surface the costal surface is covered by subscapularis muscle so as it is co covering the uh, crossing the anterior occipital joint so here there is out pouch of the uh, synovial membrane through a gap in the capsule and forms a subscapular bursa okay subscapular bursa and between the two tuberosity this is the lesser tuberosity or the tubercle this is a greater tubercle between these two tubercles also the capsule is deficient and the synovial membrane out pouches as a synovial shield for the long head of the biceps femoris tendon okay now head of the biceps femoris tendon and posteriorly another opening is there but that is not constant whenever it is present that is for the infraspinal test muscle okay So as you know, it's a synovial joint. So it should, the capsule should be lined by the synovial membrane. Okay, and how this synovial membrane is lining interior of the capsule, and how it is out pouching as a synovial bursa. So what is the importance of the synovial bursa? So it reduces the friction between the two bony uh, structures. Okay. come to the other ligaments anywhere in the um, synovial joint first ligament is a capsular ligament next rest are the here you will know about the glenio humeral ligaments next coraco humeral ligament coraco acromial ligament okay so glenio humeral coraco humeral and coraco acromial ligaments first come to the glenio humeral ligament so this glenio humeral ligaments they are nothing but the thickening of the anterior part of the fibrous capsule the anterior part of the fibrous capsule as it is covering the anterior aspect of the joint it thickens to form three bands which are arranged in a parallel manner okay they are arranged in a parallel manner these bands are called as superior glenio humeral ligament middle and the inferior glenio humeral ligament or bands so these are visible uh, only through the interior of the they are clearly visible through the interior of the joint okay through the outer aspect they are not so well appreciated but if you look uh, through the joint cavity they are well appreciated as a three bands that affect the anterior aspect of the capsule okay so these are the thickenings in the anterior aspect of the capsule superior middle and the inferior bands or the glenio humeral ligaments okay so they are uh, they are directed between the tubercle and the neck of the humerus to the glenoidal cavity okay anterior margin of the glenoidal cavity okay they converge towards the glenoidal cavity okay so the superior band where it is attached upper part of the lesser tubercle middle one lower part of the lesser tubercle and the inferior one to the lower part of the anatomical neck of the humerus and all three converge towards the anterior margin of the glenoidal labrum okay next is a coraco humeral ligament so it's a thick band you can appreciate it very much 
clearly okay and it is present it supports the joint from upper aspect okay so where it is attached from the root of the coracoid process okay and towards the greater tubercle of the humerus and here it blends with the supraspinatus tendon tendon okay here it blends with the supraspinatus tendon so it forms a strong uh, support from above okay next is the transverse humeral ligament this transverse as you know the content of the intertubercular sulcus or the bicepital groove is a long head of the biceps femoris okay now. so this long head of biceps femoris is retained in its position okay by by a ligament that ligament is nothing but the transverse humeral ligament which is uh, is attached at the upper part of the the two tuberosities of the humerus greater than the lesser tubercles of the humerus okay and it, uh, that transverse humeral ligament prevents the bow swinging of this tendon during the movement of shoulder joint nothing but it acts as a retinacular for the long head of the biceps femoris okay next is the glenoidal labrum so as i told the head is larger than the glenoidal cavity so there should be a deepening of this glenoidal cavity that deepening is done by the glenoidal labrum which is nothing but the fibrocartilaginous uh, ring okay or rim it's a fibrocartilaginous ring or rim which deepens the glenoidal cavity in order to hold the head of the humerus against the glenoidal cavity okay if you can see this glenoidal cavity it is thick when it approaches towards the margin of the glenoidal cavity and towards the periphery it is thin so on a cross section it will be triangular okay so it will be triangular the glenoidal labrum is attached to that and the supraglenoid tubercle is intracapsular nothing but the long head of the biceps femoris okay the long head of the biceps femoris will be intracapsular okay what is the infraglenoid tubercle is outside the glenoidal lab okay is outside the glenoidal lab so it is also lined by the synovial membrane okay this glenoidal labrum is also lined by the synovial membrane so here in the shoulder joint you will see all the muscles around the region of the shoulder they are, they are crossing the shoulder okay they are, when they are crossing the shoulder and inserting into the so all the muscles of the scapula they are crossing the shoulder region and they are inserted to the tubercles of the humerus either to the lesser tubercle or to the greater tubercle when they are going towards the insertion in between they will encounter the capsule of the shoulder joint okay so here they are tendinous so this tendinous part of the muscles okay it will blend with the capsule of the shoulder joint in order to give support additional support for the shoulder joint okay so where this tendons are flattening and they are merging with the capsule they are forming the rotator cuff of the shoulder joint so this rotator cuff nothing but the muscular tendinous cuff is formed by four muscles as already you know subscapularis supraspinatus infraspinatus and teres minor okay all these muscles are taking origin from scapula and getting inserted into the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle of the humerus okay so when they are approaching towards the humerus they are fused with the capsule of the shoulder joint and forming the rotator cuff okay so it acts as a guardian for the shoulder joint okay it will uh, check the mobility at the shoulder joint okay na okay so this four muscles are forming the rotator cuff next come to the relations of the joint so what are the relations what are the superior relations inferior in front and behind relation the superior relation as you can see in this picture there is a supraspinatus muscle subacromial bursa there is a coracoacromial arch okay there is a coracoacromial arch bridged by the coracoacromial ligament 
okay so corpacromial ligament supraspinatus and subacromial bursa or subdeltoid bursa these are forming the superior relations of the shoulder joint come to the inferior relation in the inferior relation what we will see we will see the long head of the triceps became as a again we will see the anterior posterior circumflex mural so not anterior axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex mural vessels okay and the teres major muscle these will form the inferior relation what are the infront relations so infront relations you will see the subscapularis muscle along with it you will see the short head of the biceps brachii and coracobrachialis and pectoralis major muscle and some fibers anterior fibers of the deltoid muscle come to the posterior relations posteriorly what you are seeing causing these muscles infraspinatus teres minor and the posterior fibers of the deltoid muscle okay so these are the relations of the shoulder joint next what are the movements possible at this joint and the muscles responsible for the joint movements okay so movements possible are flexion extension adduction abduction medial rotation lateral rotation and combination of the four movements flexion extension adduction abduction is nothing but the circumduction okay so first come to the flexion in the flexion the arms arm moves medially and forwards the arm moves medially and forwards so what are the muscles responsible for this movement mainly the pectoralis major muscle anterior fibers of the deltoid coracobrachialis and the biceps these are the four muscles producing the flexion of the shoulder joint okay next is the extension extension in the extension the arm moves backward and laterally moves backward and laterally so the muscles responsible are pectoralis major the sternocostal head posterior fibers of the deltoid teres major and the latissimus dorsi these are the muscles responsible next uh, movement is the adduction and abduction in abduction we will carry our arm away from the trunk okay so when arm moves away from the trunk that is a abduction if you will add your arm towards your body okay if you move your arm towards your body that is a adduction abduction is initiated by the supraspinatus muscle okay and then it is carried by the middle fibers of the deltoid and then above 90 degrees is assisted by the trapezius and the serratus anterior muscle so at the initial stage the supraspinatus muscle starts the abduction which is carried by the deltoid muscle and further uh, further abduction i think but uh, overhead abduction is in uh, carried by the trapezius and the serratus anterior muscle adduction is nothing but adding the arm towards the body it is carried by the these group five muscles the pectoralis major teres major coracobrachialis latissimus dorsi and and the subscapularis muscle okay so then there is a rotation along the central axis of the bone okay so these rotational movements they take place along the central axis of the bone the medial rotation and the lateral rotation in the medial rotation in order to show the rotation of the shoulder joint one should flex the elbow joint otherwise it will be confused with the supination and pronation movement okay so in order to perform the rotational movements at the shoulder the elbow should be flexed okay so in the medial rotation hand moves medially that is in the lateral rotation hand moves laterally as you can see in this picture okay so in the medial uh, what are the muscles responsible for the medial rotation these are the five muscles okay pectoralis major teres major anterior fibers of the deltoid latissimus dorsi and subscapularis and for the lateral rotation infraspinatus teres minor and the posterior fibers of the deltoid you should remember for rotational movements the elbow should be fixed flexed okay nothing but circumduction circumduction is a combination of flexion abduction next extension and adduction 
ഓക്കെ ഇങ്ങനെ സീരീസ് ലക്ഷൻ അബ്ഡക്ഷൻ എക്സ്റ്റൻഷൻ ആൻഡ് അഡക്ഷൻ ഓക്കെ സോ സർക്കൺഡക്ഷൻ ഇസ് എ കോൺഷ്യസ് മൂവ്മെന്റ് ഓഫ് ലിംബ് വിച്ച് ഇൻക്ലൂഡ്സ് ലക്ഷൻ അബ്ഡക്ഷൻ എക്സ്റ്റൻഷൻ ആൻഡ് അഡക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് ദി ലിംബ് ഓക്കെ so those are the movements possible so what are the movements flexion extension adduction abduction and rotation medial rotation lateral rotation and the combination of four movements flexion extension adduction abduction performs the circumduction come to the blood supply so the blood supply of the shoulder joint is derived from the anterior posterior circumflex mineral vessels suprascapular vessels and subscapular vessels uh, this anterior posterior circumflex and the subscapular vessels they are derived from the axillary vessels whereas the suprascapular vessel is derived from the subclavian vessels okay so as you can see in this picture this is the anterior circumflex this is the posterior circumflex okay anterior and posterior circumflex this is the suprascapular artery okay and here we will find the subscapular artery okay these are the four vessels that, uh, that will contribute to the blood supply of the shoulder joint which is having a rich blood supply come to the nerve supply it is supplied by the axillary nerve suprascapular nerve and the musculoskeletal nerve in this picture you can make out the suprascapular nerve axillary nerve okay come to the upper aspects of the shoulder limb the main one is the dislocation the dislocation of the shoulder joint is common and it is usually occurring in the inferior direction because inferiorly the joint is the least supported and when this uh, dislocation occurs as the, in the inferior relation you will see the axillary nerve it will in, uh, lead to the injury of the axillary nerve so why this dislocation occur either due to the excessive extension or the lateral rotation of the humerus these are the two causes for the dislocation of the humerus so it can be anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation based upon the direction of the uh, humeral head whether it has descended anteriorly or posteriorly if it comes anteriorly it is anterior dislocation if it is uh, directed posteriorly it is a posterior dislocation okay so how to know that uh, the shoulder joint is dislocated so there is a rounded contour of the shoulder in case of dislocation there will be a depression in the rounded contour of the shoulder okay so clinically how can you uh, find out the, that there is a dislocation in the shoulder joint then first one there is a hollow Okay, or there is a depression in the rounded contour of the shoulder joint and there is a prominence of the shoulder tip nothing but the acromion process you can't make out the acromion process in a healthy individual if the acromion process of the shoulder tip is pointed prominent then it indicates that there may be a dislocation in the shoulder joint okay so these are the two important clinical features in dislocation next is a frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis okay frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis so there is a pain and there is a limitation in all the movements of the shoulder joint if you go for radiological examination there is no change because no bony parts are involved in case of frozen shoulder the defect lies in the capsule okay so what happens to the capsule there is a shrinkage of the joint capsule because of which there is a limitation of the movements and which leads to the pain also and usually this frozen shoulder is seen in at the age of 42 to 60 years okay this seen between the 42 to 60 years of age okay so what is the reason for the frozen shoulder due to the shrinkage of the capsule okay and what next is a rotator cuff disorders so it usually occurs in males after the age of 50 years so what are the causes the, uh, this causes includes 
calcific supraspinatus tendinitis and subacromial bursitis so what will happen in the calcific supraspinatus tendinitis tendinitis okay there is a deposition of the calcium salts in the supraspinatus tendon okay because of deposition of the calcium salts it leads to the irritation of the uh, the subacromial bursa okay so here there is a location of the subacromial bursa that will lead to the so deposition of the calcium salts lead to the irritation of the subacromial bursa and there is a inflammation of the bursa that leads to the subacromial bursitis okay pain usually occur between the 60 to 120 degrees of adduction okay up to 60 degrees there is no pain between 60 and 120 degrees only you will feel a pain so it is called as painful arc syndrome painful arc syndrome okay. so as i told there is a, due to the deposition of the calcium salts there is it irritation of the subacromial bursa leading to subacromial bursitis and which in turn leads to the pain okay so when there is a overhead abduction okay what will happen the subacromial bursa it uh, slips it descends down then you will not feel any pain okay up to 160 to 120 degrees only you will feel there will be a pain so how to test it just press below the acromion process on the middle fibers of the deltoid just below the acromion process on the middle fiber uh, fibers of the deltoid if you press then it will lead to pain when between 60 to 90 degrees if you examine the same point beyond 120 degrees there is no pain sensation because the subacromial bursa has descended down okay so that is about the shoulder joint okay next uh, ball and socket joint in the inferior extremity is the hip joint okay uh, here it is equivalently mobile to that of shoulder joint but the range of movements are restricted the movements are same but the range is restricted so what are the articular surfaces i think you know what are the articular surfaces in the hip joint there is a two articular surface one ball one socket ball is formed by the head of the femur okay this one you can see make out in this picture there is a head of the femur next socket is formed by the acetabular cavity okay there is a lunate horseshoe shaped articular surface was in here that forms the other articular surface okay one is a head one is a lunate articular surface of the acetabulum okay so here also they are covered by means of hyaline articular cartilage hyaline articular cartilage and at the periphery of the acetabular cavity okay or acetabular fossa you will see no acetabular fossa acetabular cavity same like that of renal labrum here you will see the attachment of the acetabular labrum which is nothing but the fibrocartilaginous ring okay same so here the function of this acetabular labrum is not to make the articular surface deepen but it holds the head of the femur against the lunate articular surface the main function is holding the head against the lunate articular surface rather than deepening the acetabular cavity okay so as you know the free ends of the acetabular lunate articular surface it will present a notch acetabular notch this acetabular notch is bridged by the transverse acetabular ligament okay transverse acetabular ligament between the head so between the head and the between the head and the transverse acetabular ligament you can see another ligament triangular ligament attached here that is the ligament of head of femur okay so this one is the ligament of head of femur okay and interiorly was in the non articular area the non articular area is called as acetabular fossa which in living is filled with acetabular pad of fat okay 
See here. This is the femoral articular surface. And this one, this lunate articular surface. Okay. Of the establum. In between, this is the establer labrum, transverse establer ligament, and attachment of the ligament of head of femur. Okay, ligament of head of femur. Okay, so this is the lunate articular surface, horseshoe shape, establer fossa, and this one is bridged by the transverse establer ligament. This establer notch is bridged by the transverse establer ligament, converting into establer foramen, through which the branches of the obturator vessels will end up. Okay. So that is about the articular surface. Next, as it is a synovial joint, first one is a capsular ligament. So how the capsule is attached here? Okay, you are seeing the posterior aspect of the hip joint. Okay. So where the capsule is attached? As you know, in the femur, anteriorly, between the trochanters, there are two bony projections. Okay, one small, one large. The large one is a greater trochanter, the smaller one is a lesser trochanter. Okay, connecting these two anteriorly and posteriorly, there are intertrochantic line and intertrochantic crest. The line is anterior. Intertrochantic line is anterior, whereas, whereas the intertrochantic crest is posteriorly present. Okay. So, this capsule anteriorly it is attached to the intertrochantric line. Okay, intertrochantric line. Okay, now anteriorly the capsule is attached to the intertrochantric line. Whereas posteriorly it is not attached to the intertrochantric crest, but it, uh, it, it is attached to one centimeter parallel and above, one centimeter parallel and medial to the intertrochantric crest. Okay, intertrochantric crest. That is attachment of the capsule to the femur. Okay. Next is attachment of the capsule to the establer. So it is attached along the establer rim. Okay. Attached along the establer rim outside the establer labrum. Outside the establer labrum, you will find the attachment of the capsule of the hip joint. And you can see the capsule, you can make out. You can see fibers, they are running in different directions, means outer fibers, they are longitudinally placed, sorry, spirally placed, as well as uh, inner fibers, they are longitudinal. And these longitudinal fibers, they are reflected onto the neck as a retinacular fibers, okay? Outer one are spirally arranged, the inner one are longitudinally arranged. The longitudinally arranged fibers, they are reflected towards the head. Okay, and they will form the retinacular fibers. These retinacular fibers are important because as they carry the blood vessels towards the neck and the head. Okay, next is the synovial membrane. So the capsule is interiorly lined by the synovial membrane. Okay, no? So it is attached to the margins of the articular surfaces and it covers a portion of the neck. The neck which lies within the joint cavity. Okay, and as the ligament of head of femur is intracapsular, so it lines or it ensures the ligament of head of femur and covers the pad of fat in the establer fossa. Okay, so here uh, you will see outpouching of the synovial membrane through a gap in the anterior wall of the capsule that is called the psoas bursa, where this gap is present between the two ligaments, iliofemoral and the pubofemoral ligament. There is a gap through which the synovial membrane are purchased as a synovial, sorry, so as per se. Okay, come to the ligaments. First ligament is over, that is a capsular ligament. Another ligament is a iliofemoral ligament, pubofemoral ligament, and ischiofemoral ligament. Along with it, rest to, you know, transverse establer ligament and ligament of head of femur. Okay. First, come to the iliofemoral ligament. It is an inverted y shaped ligament. The stem is directed upwards. Okay. And the two limbs are directed downwards. The two limbs are attached to the intertrochantric line. Okay. This is the intertrochantric line. So it is attached to the intertrochantric line. The stem is attached to the anterior inferior iliac span. Anterior 
inferior index finger. So it's also called as ligament of Bigelow. It is one of the strongest ligament in our body. Its function is main. Main function is to prevent the body falling. When you, when you suddenly stand up from sitting portion, you're not falling backwards. Okay, because of this ligament only, because it maintains the stability of the hip joint and holds the head of the femur opposite to the acetabulum. Okay, it supports the um, joint anteriorly. Okay, just medial to it, you will see another ligament that is a pubofemoral ligament. Pubofemoral ligament, which is attached to the iliopubic eminence and the obturator crest and laterally towards the lower part of the intercrophantic line. Okay, so between these two ligaments, sometimes what happens, you will see the outpouching of the synovial membrane near from the psoas bursa. Okay, next, on the anterior aspect, two ligaments are there. On the posterior aspect, you will see the third ligament, that is the ischiofemoral ligament which is attached along the establer margin, okay? And spirally, it is arranged spirally and goes towards the greater trochanter, okay? Greater trochanter. So see here. This is the iliofemoral ligament, ligament of the below, strongest ligament of our body. Next is the pubofemoral ligament, okay? And this is the ischio femoral ligament. Two anteriorly, one posteriorly. <coughs> and the rest are the two ligaments, you know, transverse stabular ligament and the ligament of head of femur. This transverse stabular ligament is nothing but derived from the stabular labrum. So cartilage, labrum is cartilage, means, but we are telling that transverse stabular ligament is derived from the stabular labrum. What, what is happening there? There is no cartilage cells in the transverse stabular ligament. Okay, and it bridges the stabular notch converting between the foramen, stabular foramen. From the transverse stabular ligament to the head of the femur. In the head of the femur, just away from the center, there is a depression, fovea or pit. Okay. From the pit to the transverse stabular ligament, you will see a triangular expansion of the ligament. This is the ligament of head of femur. The importance of this ligament of head of femur is that it will convey the uh, epiphyseal vessels to the head. Okay, epiphyseal vessels to the head. Next, come to the relations of the hip joint. Before going to the relations, so ligaments are first capsule. Two ligaments anteriorly, one posteriorly, and two anteriorly. Okay. The anterior one has iliofemoral, pubofemoral. Posterior one is a ischiofemoral. And anteriorly, you are seeing the transverse stabular ligament and the ligament of head of femur. Okay. Come to the relation. So, in this diagram, you can clearly make out what are the anterior relation, posterior, superior, inferior. So, anterior relations is, are this straight head of the rectus femoris. Next, you will see the tendon of psoas. Iliosis. Next, we are going to see the pectineus muscle and these vessels, femoral nerve and the femoral vessels. Okay. Posterior relations, you are going to see the obturator internus with the zoomilla, quadratus femoris muscle and the sciatic nerve. Okay. Superiorly, you will see the pyloformis and gluteus minimus muscle. Okay. Pyloformis and the gluteus minimus muscle. Inferiorly, we are going to see the obturator extremus tendon. Obturator extremus tendon. So, these are the relations anterior, posterior, superior, and the inferior relations of the hip joint. Come to the moment, I told you the same movements like that of the shoulder joint, but the, there is a limitation of the movement. Okay, limitation in the degree of the movement. So, flexion, extension, abduction. So, the adduction, abduction, medial rotation, and the lateral rotation. So, this is the flexion movement, this is the extension movement, adduction movement, abduction movement, where you are moving in one limb away from the other. And when you are adding your one limb, crossing to the other, 
that is the adduction okay medial rotation and lateral rotation is uh, indicated by the movement of the foot if we rotate the uh, foot medially that will lead to the medial rotation of the hip joint if we rotate the foot laterally that will lead to the lateral rotation of the hip joint so what are the muscles responsible for these movements so flex flexion is performed by the iliosoleus rectus medius sartorius and the adductor muscles extension is nothing but uh, backward movement of the flexor thigh and it is the main extensors of the gluteus maximus and the hamstring muscles abduction adduction abduction is mainly performed by the gluteus medius and the meninges muscles that is adduction is performed by the adductor longus and brevis okay the lateral rotation is done by the piriformis obturator internus with the gemelli okay and obturator externus and the quadratus femoris muscle medial rotation is performed by the anterior fibers of the gluteus medius minimus and the tensor fasciae latae tensor fasciae latae these three muscles are responsible for the medial rotation of the hip joint and the combination of flexion extension abduction adduction is the circumduction come to the blood supply uh, blood supply of the hip joint is derived from the mainly from the medial and lateral uh, circumflex femoral artery these are the branches from the fronda femoris artery nothing but a branch of the femoral artery and the largest branch of the femoral artery in the femoral triangle okay along with it it will receive contribution from the obturator artery so they will form a circle around the Uh, upper part of the head of uh, upper part of the femur okay and uh, not only these um, these vessels are supplying but there are two anastomoses in the region of the femur in the trochanteric fossa you will see the trochanteric anastomosis and behind there is a cruciate anastomosis so these two anastomoses also provide blood supply to the hip joint okay so i told you na the capsule is reflected the capsular fibers are reflected from the intertrochanteric line as retinacular fibers this is na retinacular fibers carry the retinacular artery is derived from the and um, medial and the lateral circumflex femoral arteries okay come to the nerve supply the nerve supply is mainly derived from the femoral nerve obturator nerve and the sciatic nerve so in the la anteriorly sciatic nerve posteriorly and medially the obturator nerve these three nerves are going to supply the hip joint okay this femoral nerve not only supplying to the hip joint it will also um, go and supply to the knee joint okay common and the nerve to quadratus femoris also supplies to the hip joint that's why what will happen if uh, there is a disease of uh, hip joint there is a referred pain in the knee joint also because of the common nerve supply okay so here the vessa are important the vessa are seven in number four in relation to the gluteus maximus one in relation to the gluteus medius one in relation to the minimus and one in relation to the psoas tendon so overall there are four vessels nothing but the odd portion of the synovial membrane in order to avoid the friction between the muscle and the bone okay for the lubrication purpose there are formation of the vessel so four in relation to the gluteus maximus okay here you can see the vessel one under the psoas Ilio soas tendon, okay. One in relation to the ischium, ischial versa. One in relation to the greater trochanter. In the relation to greater trochanter, posteriorly, laterally, and anteriorly, we will see three versa, okay. And one in relation to the gluteus medius, okay. One in relation to the gluteus minimus, okay. So come to the stability of the hip joint. Instability 
um, depends mainly on the shape of the bones. The sternum is very deep, okay, and it includes nearly all the head of the femur. And this this uh, decreases the probability of dislocation, which is common in case of shoulder joint. Here there is a probability of dislocation is very less because of the articular surface. And this uh, stabular labrum, I told you know, it holds the head of the femur in position. Main function is it. And there are strong ligaments. There are strong ligaments which surrounds the joint. As you know, iliofemur, iliofemural, lipofemural, and ischiofemural ligaments. They are very strong and that they will uh, um, stabilize the capsule. Okay, they will additionally support the capsule in preventing the dislocation. And there are a lot of muscles surrounding this joint and the strength of the muscle also prevent, uh, is a factor for the stability of the hip joint. Okay, already in the previous class, uh, this Trendlinburg's test is over. Sign is, I think you know what will happen. If a person is Trendlinburg positive, mainly the abductors of the hip are affected. Okay, mainly the abductors of the hip, means gluteus medius and minus are affected. So when the abductors are weak, what will happen? If a person try to stand on one leg, Okay, and there is the other leg is off the ground. What will happen in, in a case of normal individual, the posture is maintained. But if the abductors are paralyzed or weak, what will happen? So there is a flexion, flexion of the hip towards the affected side. It will lead to the flexion of the hip towards the affected side. Means here, in this case, you will see the right abductors of the hip are paralyzed. That's why there is a flexion of the hip towards the right side. Okay. So, in this, if a person is standing and there is a flexion towards the towards the side where the abductors are affected, then this type of condition is called a Tendlenburg's positive sign. Okay. If it is abductors are normal, then there is no abnormality in the gait. The posture of the hip is maintained. But if abductors are affected, then there is a flexion of the hip joint on the affected side. Okay. So that is a positive and negative Tendlenburg sign. It is mainly due to the paralysis of the abductors. The abductors of the hip, they are supplied with a superior gluteal now. So when there is injury of the superior gluteal now also, there is a tendon burst positive sign. Okay, and I told you, the effort pain of the hip joint, it can be felt in the knee joint due to the same nerve supply. Okay, as the nerve supply is same. Okay. That in case of diseases of hip joint like tuberculosis, the pain is also referred to the knee joint because of the common nerve supply to the two joints. Okay, thank you.